Hope you still like me after these stories. Hey guys, it's Kanika. Welcome back to my channel. Today, I'll be discussing why sociopaths, psychopaths, and other individuals with ASPD hurt others. Make sure you stick till the end for some not so nice stories about my childhood. It's some of the more shocking and savage stuff I've done so far. I've changed though, I promise. <laughs> the first and foremost reason sociopaths hurt people is also quite ironic. It happens to be loneliness. So the actions that push people away are coming from a longing for love, affection and attention. During childhood, a lot of cluster Bs have had to endure abuse, abandonment or cold and callous families that punish emotions and encourage neglect. A good way for me to describe this loneliness is picturing a person on the outside of a window pane looking in. We're in a world that doesn't understand us and initially we don't understand it. We can see happiness and belonging, we can see jubilation and emotions we're not accustomed to but we want the same feeling everybody else has. When we don't feel it, we fake it and it becomes tiresome and exhausting. If we don't fake it, people would begin to hate us and the isolation would be further fueled. Essentially, it would ensure that we remain lonely as nobody would want to be around us. Bitterness and a lack of empathy, remorse and a developing boredom and violence can have catastrophic results. Low functioning sociopaths find it incredibly difficult to recognize the source of this loneliness and do not place blame on themselves for their antisocial and often illegal behavior. They lash out at every opportunity and have no accountability. A high functioning sociopath or psychopath will build on the accumulative experiences and recognize how best to navigate them. We are able to control ourselves for the most part, but eventually we crack and decide to make people feel what we feel. This would likely be a planned attack, which could cause mass destruction to those around us. But sometimes we struggle to contain the impulses and boredom. Comparatively, we focus on the end goal, while low function sociopaths do not stretch their vision past the present moment. For example, Ted Bundy calculated his plan to exact revenge on his ex-girlfriend for causing him immense loneliness and carried out a plan over two whole years. A lower functioning sociopath would not have this patience or skill. They would likely burst sooner and would not plot this well. The second reason why we hurt people is that it helps us get ahead. In a corporate or competitive setting, we do not see people as people. We see them as targets or roadblocks in our path and often the easiest solution is to just take out the competition with as much force and aggression as possible. Spreading rumors or other negative information that may or may not be true, gaslighting, sycophancy at the expense of others, being two-faced and manipulative and making outright shocking claims and allegations that have no basis in reality are just a small amount of tactics that people with ASPD use to get our way without violence violence or other physical force. I did a fair bit of this in my younger years, particularly in my career as a student politician. I had to backstab a lot of friends, and I mean a lot, and I was surrounded by men with ASPD traits. While it's not a great thing to boast about, at least I wasn't as bad as the guy who betrayed his own mother. Creating an atmosphere of fear with implied threats and underhanded schemes allows us to take control of power and to use it in a way to intimidate competitors from crossing us. A perpetual state of fear keeps people submissive, pliable, and easy to remove when necessary. We must also remember that high-functioning sociopaths often will use charm, charisma, and benevolence to get their way. It's the ultimate strategy to encourage subservience and devotion. Low functioning sociopaths are often unable to enter the corporate environment and would often be using their traits to manipulate in the streets with violence instead of being in a boardroom. The third reason sociopaths hurt people is because we are bored. This doesn't necessarily mean we are bored of you as a person, though I must admit it is true in many, many cases. Boredom makes us restless, agitated, depressed, those who lack self-awareness, potentially violence. We get bored of people and situations very easily, especially when we start to understand a person and see how predictable and uninteresting they really are. We like mystery and thrills, not routines, not schedules, not seeing the same person repetitively and doing the same things. For me personally, I tire of emotional people and vulnerability within a couple of weeks and I'm always looking for a new experience. 
my sporadic interest in people wanes as soon as I know their reactions and motivations. Chaos is exciting. What we have to do to create it is what hurts people. It's not the pain of others that we find exciting, but the drama and unpredictability that goes hand in hand with that. Some examples include, again, starting rumours, emotionally manipulating people by playing hot and cold, toying with people's emotions to see how they'll react or burst, creating hostile environments where others are self-conscious, triangulating or playing people off one another to watch, leading people on by offering fake promises of love and affection, and callous destruction of their wants and needs. Make sure to stay till the end to hear my unsanitized stories. The fourth reason is our inherent need to have control and the ability to callously discard others. There is no better way to keep a person compliant and on their toes than showing them how easily they can be replaced or dropped. This cycle begins during the love bombing stage, where we aren't necessarily showing affection to manipulate others. We genuinely do get excited when we meet new people and romantic interests. And we tend to overshare this because we cannot self-regulate love and joy. However, this love and affection wears off quite quickly, often when we found someone else to explore. And this is when our interest becomes weaponized. The best way to explain this parable is imagining love and attention as a shower. Initially, for us, the tap is on full blast for the new person and they feel all of our love and gestures of kindness. Then it begins to deteriorate to the point where they are starting to beg for simple droplets of our attention and are grateful for smaller and smaller acts on our part. We enjoy this control and will use it as often as we can as it creates a feeling of omnipotence and power. It's also a feature of dark psychology that creates obsessions and insecurities in those around us. I will explain this further in another video. The fifth reason sociopaths hurt people is the lack of usefulness and value that we can see in the people in our lives. Low-functioning sociopaths make it very obvious that they are leading parasitic lifestyles and choose their partners and friends for the benefits that they bring. They are shockingly transparent in the way they do this and people are thrown off by their manner and run as they probably should. High functioning sociopaths are more logical when it comes to evaluating. They weigh the pros and cons of someone being in our lives and of course we see relationships as transactional. So when we realize that we're putting an effort for no clear reward, we lose interest in that person. As terrible as this sounds, if someone brings nothing of value to us, we will drop them and we won't be too friendly about it either. It is dehumanizing as there's no inherent value in other humans. It must be earned and it must be shown. High functioning sociopaths do tend to still live parasitic lifestyles but have the ability to be subtle about it. Manipulation tends to come in handy as we can show that we are doing more than we actually are in order to extract more attention, affection, resources, benefits from the other person. This means that we don't need force or physical violence when low functioning people do. The sixth reason is that we are often overcome with rage and anger. We have a very, very low tolerance for frustration and small things that would be a minor inconvenience to neurotypicals could be terribly overwhelming for us. For example, if we want to go do something like go to a specific movie or go to a certain restaurant and the person with us won't comply, a rage begins to form. And I believe this is from the inherent entitlement most sociopaths have. We become infuriated that someone doesn't want to do something that we want to do. Our control appears to be declining alongside our value. When someone is misbehaving per se. We have a number of tactics we can deploy that have surprising efficacy. Silent treatment and passive aggressive behavior, depriving the person of the usual amount of attention and love they receive, gaslighting and creating jealousy by using another person as a tool to be trotted out and be lavished with the attention of your partner is craving. Lower functioning sociopaths will often resort to domestic violence tactics of intimidation and they will strive to create fear and uncertainty. They will also not allow the other person to speak or get their point across. And this eventually leads to frustration, obedience and deference is soon to follow. The seventh reason is simply that sociopaths do not care and get tired of keeping up a facade. To put it bluntly, people with ASPD have a hard time seeing other people as fully autonomous humans that have needs and desires and ambitions. We tend to believe that the world is, well, ours. 
and our needs supersede those of others. People are sometimes seen as inanimate objects, conquests, assets, liabilities, or roadblocks, as I mentioned earlier. This encompasses all aspects of our lives and relationships, romantic, platonic, and corporate. We have so many masks that we must wear, a unique one for each relationship, as we are obviously social chameleons. We have to change our personalities to meet our end goal from each person. The desires of others are only relevant to us when we want to extract something from them. It becomes easy to placate them if we indulge their needs and offer our benevolence. And when we have no more use for them, we absolutely do not care about them as people. And it isn't from a place of callousness. But to us, it's similar to being done playing with a certain toy. We found something new and shiny and it's time for us to leave. The mask begins to become too bothersome and heavy to carry along with us and we just want space and the ability to be ourselves in our natural state in our downtime. Being forced to leave our real selves where they exist is painful and can cause long-term depression or other mood disorders and the baggage of other people isn't viable any longer. High-functioning sociopaths will remove people from their life swiftly and mostly without pain. The person may be manipulated into thinking it is their idea to extricate themselves. Therefore, fewer feelings are hurt. While discarding can be fulfilling, we have enough foresight to see the possible complications of it. Low-functioning people do not. So now, on to the stories from my past. Hope you still like me after these stories. Okay, so I have this story from my childhood. It was when I was, I think I was 11 or so. And my parents took me to India with my brother to visit my grandparents and my other relatives. And when I got there, we have a tenant on one of our floors, right? Basically, that woman, she took me out to the shops and she bought me Barbie dolls and like little outfits that I wanted. And I was really, really happy. And I was just like absolutely thrilled because my parents like refused to spoil us to that point. I don't really understand my reasoning behind why I did what I did but when I got home and I had all my toys my outfits and stuff that she had bought I wrote this letter to her and it wasn't a good letter <laughs> I said it was from the gardener which of course was difficult at the time because the gardeners and manual laborers in India don't tend to speak English and certainly don't write it I told her to go and <clears throat> herself I threatened physical violence and I messed up some things on her stairs with oil which would eventually cause a very significant fall and eventually led to further incidents that involved quite a lot of stairs. She came down, she didn't slip on the oil and told my mum what I had done and my mother was so furious. I had no explanation because I just thought it was fun. I just liked causing a bit of trauma and drama and like tension in these personal relationships and I guess she was very confused as to to why I would threaten her with violence for her doing a nice thing and I don't understand it either. So I have a funnier story. Oh, it wasn't too long ago. I was like 23 or 24. So I got a job in the Whit Sundays because I thought, fuck, I need to get out of Sydney. I'm sick of this place. I want to go to warm weather. And so I got myself this cool ass job. So I land there and the next morning I have to go to work. That morning I get ready, get my best outfit, get my makeup on and I go to work. When I get there, it's in this dingy little office with like no natural sunlight. It's just really, really dull and uninspiring. So I decide that this is not really the job I want to do anymore. When I was going to my lunch break, I ended up having these really strong stomach pains. And while they were real, they were not to the level that I was telling them that they were at. And so I told them I was going home. And by home, I assumed they thought that I meant my home where I was staying. But instead, I just drove straight to the airport, took a flight and back to Sydney and didn't tell anybody. Anyway, so a month later, they sent me a notice and said I'd been terminated from the job, which I assumed was the case anyway, because I didn't turn up for the next month. It was pretty funny at the time and uh, looking back I'm just like that doesn't really make sense and I don't know why I did that. So this moves me on to a boy who I will not name because I think he watches this channel. I broke up with him over text because I didn't really care about him at all and I just didn't want to spend any time having to see him because I'd found someone more interesting. He was absolutely devastated. I don't know why because we'd only been on a couple of dates and I didn't like him at all. Like I'd known him since I was in high school, like year seven. It was never 
a real thing. I only went out with him because I was really bored. Anyway, so he is devastated and he comes to my house and refuses to leave. So he was parked right outside my bedroom. He proceeded to sit there for hours waiting for me to come out and break up with him in person. I also, at this point, forgot that it was his birthday. So on his birthday, he was sitting right outside my house waiting for me to come and make him feel better and not break up with him, which of course I did not do. It would have been better if I didn't do this on his birthday, but what happened, happened. Okay, to wrap up, I need to explain that these are the raw sentiments of sociopathy and psychopathy, and all of what I've spoken about has the ability to turn into abuse and heavy manipulation when used for the wrong reasons. If it was being done to better other people, it could be more understandable. The behavior is toxic and damaging to relationships, which makes it ultimately more destructive than a lot of neurotypical relationships. It is so important to seek therapy and self-awareness and to deny natural urges to hurt and control people negatively. If an open dialogue is created, we can bounce ideas off one another and find ways to channel our energy into successful, helpful endeavors. Selfish gain can only be useful for so long and the next you step on tend to come back to haunt you. I'm hoping you guys enjoy the video and I'm excited to create new content for you guys.